giving reasons to answers, drawing histograms, using a graph to solve equations, finding the equation of a perpendicular bisector and finding the turning points of graphs. Those are all things students have struggled with in this paper and I'm going to show you how to do it all. Let's go. Question 1. Thomas is selling lots of stuff. He needs money. The amounts he receives are in the ratio 14 to 17 to 9. So that means if he gets 14 dollars for a computer, he gets 17 dollars for a bike, he gets 9 dollars for a phone. Okay, percentages is always the amount, so the amount for the phone, which is the last value in the ratio, is 9 as a percentage of the total. Total, of course, we just add them together. Forty, so it's nine out of forty percentage. We times it by a hundred. Twenty-two and a half percent. Sweet, perfect. Show some working out. Yeah, that's important for the method mark. Interesting here are the most mistakes where we're just adding wrong or using not using the calculator correctly. All right, so just don't rush it, take your time, think it through. Part two. So he receives $560. So let's take that ratio. <clears throat> the ratio is 14, 17, and 9. That means if he gets $14 for a computer, he gets $17 for a bike it gets nine dollars for a phone if we add that together we've already done that do this again we get 40. so that means if he were to get those amounts he would get a total of 40 dollars but he didn't get 40 dollars of course he got 560 dollars so we need to ask ourselves how do we get from 40 to 560 how do we get from there to there what do we multiply it by Okay, so to do work that out, we just do things backwards. Okay, 560 divided by 40, or 56 divided by 4, which would be 15, no, 14, isn't it? Let's check. Don't take any chances. 14 it is. So that means we need to multiply our ratio by 14. Every value there, we need to multiply by 14. Okay, although do we really have to? No, they only want to know the bike. So bike is the middle value, which is the 17. So let's multiply the 17 by 14. And that's what he should be getting for the bike. Okay. We can just to check if everything is correct, do it all. Yeah, let's do 14 times 14 plus 17 times 14 plus 9 times 14 that should add up to 560 as it does got the right answer there follow through from adding the ratio together dividing it into 560 and you've done it Part three. Now Thomas was selling his bike after he bought it for hundred and ninety-five dollars, and he was hoping to make a profit of twenty-five percent. There is two ways to do this. Okay. Method one would be, or one of the methods, is to look what twenty-five percent profit would look like. Okay. So if we want to sell something for a profit of twenty-five percent. That means we take 100%, we take the full price, we add on 25%, which means we'll end with 125%. As a multiplier, that is, of course, 1.25. So, we need to take the original price, the price he bought the bike for, and multiply it by 1.25. That is like doing an increase of 25%. So if he wanted 
to make 25% profit, he had to sell it for $243.75. Okay, what did he sell it for? For $238. Yeah, that's what... Yes, he's selling everything. He sold the bike for 238 So, we need to write an answer to the question. We haven't done that yet. We've just shown what we've done. So, we say no. He needed to sell it for... How much was he short? We don't have to do that. It's just uh, this is track 238. It was five dollars seventy-five short, so five dollars seventy-five more. That's one way. Okay, another way. Another method. Oh, this is the second method. Is to say what is the actual profit? Okay. So if he sold it for 238 and he bought it for 195, the actual profit he made was $43. That's the actual profit. So to work out the percentage profit, we put the actual profit over the original price. And we times it by 100. So 43 divided by 195 times 100. He made 22.1, rounded to three significant figures, 22.1% profit. Okay, you see, I've done like two steps there. That means it's probably two marks. To get full marks, you need to answer the question. No, he only made... 22.1% profit. You don't have to do both, just do one. I just showed you both because I like it. Yeah, so that is the two methods. And no. So you see the answer and no. They want to see that? No. And there's the other method. Okay. Candidates were expected to write a conclusion such as, such as no, he did not. A significant number omitted their conclusion. So you need to answer the question with a word, at least a no. Question B, there's the keyword, simple interest. So we need to remember the formula for simple interest. Formula is I equals P R T over 100 okay remember that I stands for interest interest is only the extra money you get by putting your money in the bank P is the principal that is the amount that you put in the bank originally R of course is the rate which is 1.3 and T is the time, the years. We divide that by 100. And let's see what we get. Fifty-six, fifty-five. $56.55. Always check closely. What do they want to know? Well, they only want to know the interest, not the total amount. So we're happy. We don't have to add it on. There we go. And the simple formula. Be careful not to use the compound interest formula and don't spoil your answer by adding it to the original amount. Part C is reverse percentages. First thing, of course. He is uh, prices are reduced by $24. When you're reducing something by $24, the multiplier stays the same. It doesn't matter what the calculation is after that. The multiplier is always, they took 100% of the price, the original price, that's 100%. They reduce it by 24% and you end up with 
76%, which of course is 0 0.76. Okay, that means if you take the original price, you need to multiply it by 0 0.76 to get the sale price, what you sell it for. Okay, now because they want to know the original price, we need to rearrange our equation. So we're going to take the sale price and divide it by 0 0.76. When we go like back in time, we need to do the opposite calculation. Instead of multiplying, we divide it. So that will give us the original price. So what is the sale price? 36.86 divided by 0 0.76. $48.50. Okay, which makes sense. It was $48.50, they reduced it, now it's cheaper, $36.86. And there's the correct answer. Question two, now we have Anna. Hello, Anna. Anna is popular, she gets a lot of text messages. But one day she got 38 text messages. I mean, 13 is the least she got in one. That's a lot. Anyway, so Anna is definitely popular. So complete the stem and leaf diagram for this. Right, remember the stem is the tenths and the rest is the units. So I'm going to start this off by using my pencil and I go one by one so I don't miss any out. So one. 7, 17 is 1, 7, 15 is 1, 5, 31 is 3, 1, 1. Right, now, for a complete correct stem and leaf diagram, it has to be in the correct order. So that's why I use my pencil. Now I can switch the pen and rewrite them in the correct order. So the first one needs to be 3, 5, 7, 8. Then the next one needs to be 2, 1s, 2, 7, 8, 9. And the last one, we just need to swap that 8 and the 1. in the right order okay it's nice they remind us to put the key the key is just an example of any other let's take the first one that one line three means 13 and it's done okay all correct of course your key can be any example from the from the thing it doesn't have to be one and seven Part two, we need to find the median. Median, of course, the middle. MD, median, middle. Okay, so we need to put them in order. We need to put the least amount first. So the day she only received 13 uh, messages, we put that day first. And we write all the days up to the day she received the most messages, which was 38. Now, we've already done that. That's the stem and leaf diagram. The 1, 3, 13, that's the smallest, least amount. 3, 8 is at the end. There is two ways to do this. Okay, one way is to use uh, maths, a, a little formula. The formula is simply you take the number of numbers there is. There's 14 days, there's 14 numbers we have. You add one and you divide it by two. That's 15 divided by two is seven and a half. That's not the median, that is the position where I'll find the median between the 7th and the 8th value, if they are in order. Okay, it's important to add that one, because otherwise you won't get the middle. 
Okay, so to give you a simple example, if I've got four numbers, okay, I can't do four divided by two and say, well, two is in the middle. No, you need to be four plus one divided by two, which is five, which is two and a half, which tells you the middle is between two and three. Okay, so, so we did the same just with 14, not 4. So we need to find the seventh and a half value. So we've got 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There's the seventh value, 22. So the middle is between 27 and 22 and 27. What's halfway between 22 and 27? Is it 24? Is it 25? If you're not sure, add them together and divide it by 2. That's how you find the middle. Okay. So 22 by 27 divided by 2. 24 and a half is right between 22 and 27. So that is the median. Excellent. Only one mark for all that thinking. Another method, of course, of doing this is simply by crossing off the biggest and the smallest okay so we go take your pencil and we go smallest biggest second smallest second biggest so, da, 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 da. and there we got two left so the middle is there whichever works for you the mode is the one that is the most often, okay, and this needs to be numbers next to each other. Most occurring is there's three ones next to each other, so that's the mode. And there's not one, of course, because those ones doesn't represent one, they represent 31. Got it. And the last one's the range. The range is the biggest minus the smallest. The biggest value there is 38. Smallest value being 13, which of course is 25. Question B, uh, we've got a shop, it's a weird shop, they have a very small stock, they only got 4 red and 8 grey phones, so that's a total of 12 phones. What kind of shop only has 12 phones? Alright, Anna and Pete each pick one of these phones at random. Work out the probability that they both pick a grey phone. Just to make this, let's do a, a uh, tree diagram. Is that it? Meaning, first Anna picks a phone. Anna can be picking a red phone. Or she can pick a grey phone. The probability of this happening is, well, the red phone is 4 out of 12. And a grey phone is 8 out of 12. Then comes Pete. And he picks a phone. Again, he's got a choice of red. I think that the only criteria they have for the phone is the color, nothing else. Huh? I think there's more about a phone than just its color. Anyways, when Pete comes along, if he's going to pick a red phone, there's only three left out of the 11 phones that's left. If he's going to pick a gray phone, there will still be eight left, but only 11 phones in total. If Anna picked a grey phone, then there are still four red phones left, but only eleven phones left. But uh, if Anna picked a grey phone, there are seven grey phones out of the eleven that is left. So, what is the question? The question is what is the probability they both pick a grey phone? So this is the route we're taking. Chances is eight out of twelve for Anna. Chances for Pete is 7 out of 12, and what do we do? We add it or multiply it. Remember the probability rules. Okay, 
if the one thing or the other happens, then we add. If it's and, the one thing and the other needs to happen, we multiply. And a tree diagram, when we move one to the other, it's always multiply because it is Anna has to pick a gray phone and Pete has to pick a gray phone. So that's what we do. 8 over 12 times 7 over 11. 1433. 40 over 3 is correct or equivalent. So meaning you can write 0 0.42 recurring, 42%. Yeah, or uh, any other equivalent fraction. Question 3 here. First thing, we need to measure the angle. Measuring angles, make sure the center of your protractor is at the center there. Make sure you have the zero on the line okay and then start measuring from zero so i'm going to measure this way around i'm going to use the inside numbers because i start from zero and then let's be very very accurate okay so look at it carefully that's 90 100 110 it's below 120 110 115 1 2 3 118 i need a pen Okay, write your answers, of course, in pen. There we go. Don't cut any corners. 118. Now, on the mark scheme, it says 118. So, if you write 119 or 117, uh, I'm not so sure you'll get your marks. So, you need to be very accurate. Okay, next one. X is a point on BC. Right? So X is somewhere on here. And we need to draw X in the right place. Meaning we need to use a scale. So the scale tells us 5 centimeters equals 200 meters. Funny way to write the scale. Okay. Um, so then they give us 332 meters so let's put that with the meters how do we get from 200 to 332 that is the question okay so we just do it backwards we do 332 divided by 200 okay grab that on your calculator sorry you can't see mine at the moment okay which is 1.66 that means we need to multiply this ratio by 1.66. So we do the same on this side, multiply it by 1.66. So we times that by the 5, and we get 8.3. 8.3 centimeters. So uh, X goes from V. So from B, we need to measure 8.3 centimeters. So all right, make sure you got zero right there at B. You go from eight, eight point one, eight point two, eight point three. Be very exact and make a nice big X there, so it's really clear. Okay, you can get one mark for your working out, so please do show that. Last one, find the scale of 1 to n. So be careful here. Okay, we've got 5 centimeters is 200 meters. Now what they want to do is for us to get that first ratio a 1. So we're going to divide that by 5 to get it to 1. Do the same on the other side. Divide up 200 divided by 5, of course, is 40. Okay. Next thing to notice is that there are no units there. There's no units there, which means the units needs to be the same. Meaning anything that's one on the map will be whatever we got on the scale. So we need to get the units the same. We need to change the meters to centimeters. And how many cents is there, of course, in a dollar, a hundred, 
So we multiply this by 100. Only this one now, because we're changing the units. So that will be 4,000. Okay, which means one centimeter is 4,000. 4,000 4, centimeters, which means we don't have to write the units because they are now the same. Part B, and there's a lot of information here. So let's try to sort things out. There's a bronze statue. All right, I'm going to draw a statue. This is a statue of a ghost. Okay, there's a statue. It has a height of 4.5 meters. A mass of 195,200 kilograms and a density of 800 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay. Then there's another statue, which you don't know is it bigger or smaller. I don't know. I don't have lots of space. I'm going to assume it's smaller. It is similar, so they are exactly the same. Okay, similar means they're exactly the same, just a different size. And for this one, we have the volume. Take a look. There's the mass. There's the density. This is the mass. There's the density. We don't have the volume of this one. This one here, we don't have the mass. We don't have the density. But we got the volume of 0 0.385 meters cubed. Okay. And they want to know its height. Good. Now what? Well, they gave us a formula there. Uh, density equals mass divided by volume. So let's use that. We got the density. The density is 8,000 kilogram per meter cubed. We got the mass 195200 kilograms, but we don't have the volume. Can get the volume. Be careful now. How are we going to get the volume? Mm -hmm. Do we multiply that on that side? Yeah. Be careful. We can't divide the one nine five two hundred because it's not. It's being divided by volume. It's kind of like having your little triangle, is it not? Okay, it's mass divided by volume give you density. So if we want the volume, we need to do mass divided by density. Okay, meaning we want the volume, we do the mass 195200 kilograms divided by 8000 kilograms meters cubed okay just don't make the mistake of dividing the 8000 by 19520 okay you can also say it's like this okay so we have density equals mass divided by volume so we need to multiply the volume there and divide the density there so volume will be mass divided by density i hope that makes sense so what is the volume of the first statue? Well, it's 195200 divided by 8,000. 24. 24.4. 24.4. What? Look that kilogram and that kilogram will cancel out meters cubed. Good. So now we have the volume 24.4 meters cubed. So yeah, the first statue is definitely bigger than this, the second one. 
Okay, so we now have two values here of the two statues that we can compare. And then we can use that to change the 4.5 meter to the other one. Okay, so we need to think what is the scale factor? How many times smaller is the second statue than the first statue? Okay, another way is to write it as a proportion, as ratios. Okay, let's make this x. So the height of the second statue in meters divided by the height of the first one, because they're similar, the ratios should stay the same. Should equal, remember I put the smaller statue at the top, so that should be 0 0.385 meters cubed divided by 24.4 meters cubed. That is what similarity means, that all the proportions of the size and stuff is the same, except the units are not the same. The linear scale factor, which we have on the left, is a meter, and the volume scale factor, which we have on the right, is a meter cubed. The units are not the same, but we can solve that problem by cubing what's on the left. Easy as that. All right, so now we just need to solve that for x. So, first thing, let's get rid of that cube. If we need to get rid of that, we're going to have to cube root everything we have on the left. Okay, now I'm not going to write the units anymore. They were just there to show me units are not the same. The 0 0.385 and 24.4 are not actually being cubed. The meters cube just tells us what the units are. Okay, on the left we got 4.5. Okay, so we got rid of the brackets. So the last step, which I'm going to do over here, is we need to multiply the 4.5 on the opposite side. So it's 4.5 times the cube root of 0 0.385 over 24.4. And that's what we need to do in our calculator. And there's our answer. 1.1286. Do they tell us how to write the answer? No, just calculate the height. So if we are going to round this, round it to three significant figures. Uh, there's an eight next to the two, so you round the two up to a three. 1.13. Beautiful, correct answer. Unrounded answer also gives you full marks. I'm not going to go through all the method marks here, but it is basically what I've shown you. You see, that's that one cubes, yeah, cube root, rearranging, it's all there. Question 4a, bearings, wonderful bearings. Just remember the three rules of bearings, that north is always zero degrees, we always write three digits, and that we always measure going clockwise. So let's go through the information. Slowly, A, B, and C are three towns. You should call all the towns A, B, and C. And the bearing of C from A is 140 degrees. They show us that there. We can see it. But the, main, the focus of attention, so we're going to have to use it. B is due south of A, of A. So that just means that's a straight line. I mean, so that will be 180 degrees. And AC equals BC. That's why they put these little lines there, which tell us this is an isosceles triangle, which tell us that these two angles at the base of the isosceles triangle are the same. Okay. So, let me just do what I can. 
immediately there, I see I can work out angle BAC, all right, which is this angle over here, angle BAC, which will simply be 180 minus 114, which of course is 66. Okay, so now we know that this angle here, this is 60. 66. Base angles of an isosceles triangle is the same, so that is 66. Okay, angles in a triangle is 180, so that means 180 minus 66 twice, which is 132. That means that angle there at the top would be 40. Eight. Just a quick check, yeah. Beautiful. That is everything I could figure out from the information they gave us in these two uh, sentences. Calculate the bearing of B from C. From C, this means where you are traveling from. So that means we need to find the angle there, the bearing at that point. Okay. So what we need is a north line, just like we have there at A. So we know this is zero degrees, three digits. And we need to find the bearing, which means we need to measure going clockwise this angle here. Nice. Okay. So, we got that 48 there. If we can just find this angle, we can uh, subtract it from 360 with the 48, and we'll have the bearing. Okay. Now, what do we have here? I want you to look here. Yeah. Let's draw it over here. We have two parallel lines which is the lines going north. We've got A over here, which is 114, and we want to know that angle. What are these called? Go interior. Angles between two parallel lines, they always add up to 180. Meaning that angle there will be 66, which brings you to another thing we could have done, okay? We know that one is 66, so if we mark that angle and that one between two parallel lines, yes, what are they called? Alternate angles. Yet another way to determine that other angle there is 66. Parallel lines, remember, Z angles, alternate angles, F angles, co-interior angles. I think with B rings, that's the biggest thing that helped. Remember that you're working with parallel lines all the time. So you can look for that Z, the alternate, the go, go interior, all those angles. Okay, so we got one left, one thing left to do. That angle at C, that's a full rotation. We subtract the two angles we have, and then we'll have the bearing. Okay, let's do that. Two hundred and forty-six meaning this angle is 246. Even though it's not to scale, they will still be correct, right? 246 is less than 270, which would be a three-quarter turn. It's more than 180. So it seems like a reasonable answer. Two forty-six is correct. There are many marks you can pick up, even if you don't have the answer, for finding all kinds of different angles. I see as a simple can kind of use the working space for calculations for of angles without identifying the angles they had found. I did that. I didn't identify the angles. So it would be wise to write things like angle BAC. That one there. Right. Equals 66. Right. Thus Angle A, B, C equals 66. Can we be thorough? Be correct. 
uh, writing angle ACB is 84 that's that one there okay yeah they mentioned that so maybe that's important but B here there is clearly is a circle theorem so let's go through the information slowly and carefully PQR and S lie on a circle that piece of information tells us that this is a quadrilateral with all its corners on the circumference of the circle which means a cyclic quadrilateral so when you read that immediately you need to think what do we know about a cyclic quadrilateral there we got a cyclic quadrilateral all the corners is on the circumference of the circle and the main feature of this of course is that let me get a whole number there the opposite angles is always 180 see that 97 380 always okay they add up to 180 meaning if this angle here s is 74 then angle rqp will be 180 minus 74 which is 106 okay which is a good start so we've used this piece of information okay if you get stuck make sure you use every piece of information next one mpn is a tangent to the circle p what do we know about tangents okay let's have a look where is our tangents all right this is the tangent one rule with the tangent which they don't show here very clearly is that the radius and the tangent makes a 90 degree angle okay do we have a radius no nothing here tells us it's a radius so we can look at the other feature is that the alternate segment theorem can you see look at that 55.8 at the bottom left we got 55.8 and the top left it stays the same okay same with the other angle it makes 60.8 the opposite angle inside the triangle is 60.8 that stays the same okay you see that so alternate segment theorem is the one we got there so let's have a look do we have yes we got lots of triangles here we got that 27 angle so the opposite angle inside the triangle is equal so that means this one is 27 and with this triangle 58 means this one is 58 okay that means we've used that piece of information then it gave us the sizes of the angles we've already used that you see it okay it's already got a lot of information there so then it says find angle prs PRS what is angle PRS P oh no that doesn't work go away let's use a color here goodness PRS and I already figured that one out before remember alternate segment theorem so that's 58 find angle PQR so PQR yep I already got that one that was 106 opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral is always 180 degrees and RPQ let's check that one RPQ is this one over here don't have it yet but that's not hard to find because of course I have the other angles inside the triangle I just need to subtract the 106 and 27 and I have it forty seven 
So this one over here must be 47. Ah, there we go. 58, 106, 47. Question C, they've decided to complicate things a little bit. It's still circle theorems. Let's go through the information very carefully. A, B, and C lie on a circle. Okay, no, that doesn't. It's only three points. Center O with diameter AC. Okay, there we go, the diameter. Very interesting. Remember, diameter is two radiuses. Remember that length and that length is the same. Okay. Remember the main thing about all radii in a circle is it always stays the same length. So BO would also be the same. Yeah, you understand. OA is the same as OC is the same as OB because they're all radii of a circle which does give us an isosceles triangle, which means those two at base angles will be the same. Okay, nice. Then it's a TAM and TBN are tangents. Remember what we did before from tangents. Okay, there's the ultimate segment theorem, but there is always a tangent and a radius always forms a 90 degree angle. Let me change this to show you that. See, that angle stays 90 degrees no matter what I do. Okay. Let me change that. Okay. And there's equal lengths of the tangents from a point. Tangent from a point to a circle are equal in length. So. How can we use that information? That tells us that this is a 90 degree angle. This is a 90 degree angle. And that this length and that length is the same. Look at that beautiful kite that exposed itself now. And it gives us the size of one of the angles. Okay. My goodness, more words. Using values and geometrical reasons, complete these statements to show that CB is parallel to OT. So let's just keep our eye on the target. CB is parallel to OT. That's what we need to prove. Okay. What do we have with parallel lines? Okay, there are a few things. Remember, two parallel lines with the uh, transversal okay one of those is Z angles is the same call them alternate what else is useful is if we got parallel lines we have F angles just don't ever, ever, ever write Z or F which is corresponding and there's co-interior as well, which we used in the previous one. So I can already see that we might just be able, if we can somehow figure things out here, we can have, we can prove that this angle here is equal to that angle there, then they are, are definitely parallel. Yeah? So let's see. Now they got more stuff. In triangles AOT, AOT is the triangle at the bottom there. And BOT, it's the one just above it, OT is common. Okay, We've got too much there going on. Okay, we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that in a moment. Okay, so they're talking about this triangle. and this triangle right OT is common meaning this line in the middle it's got a common line okay so angle OAT angle OAT oh my goodness you really need to have this one and OBT, that one, equals 90 degrees. I already told you that before. 
Okay, because now we need to write the reason tangent because tangents and radius is radii or a tan because a tangent and a radius meets at 90 degrees always okay. always always I don't know if that's important that's my answer let's see if it's what they want radius perpendicular to tangent Canonists need to refer to the radius and the tangent so what I understand from that if you got the word tangent and radius in your answer and 90 degrees you'll get your marks okay but you need to study these theorems to get them right okay next one AT equals BT let's look at that now AT equals BT okay all right now you need to write down the reason let me think what can I can remember I can write the tangents from the same point are equal I think that's what I want to write let's see what the mask is tangents to circle from same point or equivalent okay many candidates refer to tangents but really mention that they were from the same point okay so here the keywords are tangents again and same point you need to mention those two words as well whether the examiner marks it they just look for the keywords and then they decide if they're going to give you the marks okay so make sure you use these keywords when you do reasons for anything All right then it says AOT is congruent to triangle BOT because of congruence criteria remember what congruence means congruence means that they are exactly the same okay there are a few reasons we have what makes triangles exactly the same okay it is all the sides are the same length so you think you got a triangle you got another triangle exactly the same means if all the sides are the same we call that SSS okay could we have angle 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 no because the triangle always adds up to 180 degrees so the angles are the same they are similar but they are not congruent they can be bigger and smaller what else if you got two sides and the angle in between then they are the same side angle side we also have what's the other one two angles so two angles and one of the sides angle side angle and then there's another one where we got right angle hypotenuse on another side which is kind of like side angle side but just with the 90 degree angles okay so what do we have here they tell us in triangles AOT OT is the same so OT is the same that is a side um, we got AT and BT is the same now before that no, that then they told us O18 of these angles are 90 degrees so then they talked about these two angles here okay that is a right angle okay so that we'd rather show there was an angle we use the R and OT is the hypotenuse and then they talked about AT and BT being the same there so that would be another side so the reason they're looking for here is RHS right angle hypotenuse side RHS nothing else all possible congruence conditions were given but few gave RHS meaning people said side 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 angle side angle side angle but they didn't do right angle hypotenuse side remember there's a right angle in it for congruency okay congruency is definitely something that is being neglected 
when students study okay so I recommend that you really go and study this then we continue with more reasons angle AOT equals angle BOT equals 56 degrees AOT angle BOT equals 56 degrees that's what they tell us okay because angles in a triangle add up to 180 yes because 34 plus 90 plus 56 is 180 that I can see angle BOC okay now they talk about that angle there BOC oh, I wanted to change the color let's get rid of oh I'm going to struggling here so that's 56 that's 56 now they talk around angle BOC equals what okay because AOC is a straight line so BOC would be 180 minus 56 twice that's where they're going towards here 180 minus 56 twice 68 so that one there is 68 okay because what did I did I said angles on a straight line do write nicely I'm really struggling on this smooth screen line equals 180 degrees angle OBC let's change this now okay so what that's 68 angle OBC all right and this we already determined earlier from the beginning that of course is an isosceles triangle so if we do 180 minus 68 and then divided by 2 because there's two angles we'll have that one gives us 56 good remember when I said about the alternate angles that's what we kind of wanted okay so what was the reason here well that's an isosceles triangle because angles in a isosceles so you spell isosceles I don't know because base angles an isosceles angle in an isosceles triangle okay is that the only one we used I'm just to be safe I'm gonna say and angles in a triangle equals 180 degrees I use both of those right we subtracted from 180 and then I'm going to write so CB is parallel to OT and that we already covered before so these two angles they form a Z angle just never write Z we'll call them alternate angles so because alternate are equal let's see if I get full marks 68 angles on a straight line add up some to 180 or equal yes that's correct how many marks that's only one mark for all of that 
base angles of an isosceles triangle. So this is correct. Base angles is what's important here. And isosceles. And they're looking here for alternate angles. Those are the keywords that you need to have, okay, to get full marks. Right, many fail to give a acceptable reason. So reasoning is important, using the correct words. But I spotted one thing here. Others gave correct reason without correct pair of matching angles. So that means. I would not have gotten full marks here. You should also write OBC equals BOT. Okay. And that with alternate angles will get you your correct mark. Oh my goodness, see, even me, I don't get full marks in these papers. You need to write as much as possible. Okay, missed it in the mark scheme is there, writing that, all of it. Dependent OBC and BOT. Okay, so you need to be as thorough as possible. This is one of the main things people struggle in this paper is giving the reasons, correct reasons, and using the correct keywords inside the reasoning. Okay, like your angles on a straight line is 180, you need to write basically all of that. Okay, you need to measure, mention base angle, isosceles triangles. You need to use the word alternative, but you also need to show which angles are equal. Right, this is definitely something that you need to study. Question five. Right, go through the information carefully. ABC is a scalene triangle, simply means all the angles are different on horizontal ground. So ABC is flat on the ground. AYX is a straight vertical post, so we're going up in the air. This is three dimensions. Then there's two wires holding it in place. I don't know if that is structurally sound. To have the wires connected at different places, they might create an imbalance, but that's a whole another engineering question. AC is 4.8 meters, BC is 5.6, and angle ACB is 20.4. There's not much I can deduct from this at this moment. They want to know AB, AB being the length of a line, that one there. So AB is inside a triangle, ABC. And what we got is we got this length of two sides and the angle in between. Okay. Talking about triangles, yep, that's trigonometry. Remember the basics of trigonometry. If you've got a right angle triangle, and you're just working with the sides, that's when you use Pythagoras. If you've got a right angle triangle and any of the other angles is involved and sides, then you use Sokatua. But what if you don't have a right angle triangle, a scalene triangle like this one here? Okay. Well, then there are, of course, the sine rule. Okay, so that is in a scalene triangle. And the sine rule is easy to spot. If you have an angle and the opposite side, and then another angle or side, then you can use the sine rule to calculate stuff. Okay, but that's the criteria. You need at least an angle and the opposite side to use the sine rule. Whereas we get to the cosine rule, then there are two things. If you have all the sides and you want to know an angle, use the cosine rule. 
or if you've got two sides and the angle in between, you use the cosine rule. And what do we have? we got two sides and the angle in between. So that's how we know we're going to use the cosine rule. Let's write it down. Okay, for this one, we use a straightforward cosine rule, which starts with Pythagoras. And then it's just minus 2BC cos A. Okay. Now, the smart thing to do here, to not confuse yourself, let's relabel this triangle. Okay. Or we can do it on the left there, so I don't mess up my old drawing here. I'm going to relabel it. Okay. The side I want to know, I'm going to make the lower case A. Okay. That means the side opposite to that, we've got to relabel it the upper side, upper case A. Then the other two sides, doesn't matter which way around you label it. This one is already uppercase B, so I'm going to make that lowercase B the opposite side to the angle B. So we're going to change this A to a C, which make that C. Okay. Makes it a little bit easier using the formula. So the side we want to know AB is this one then. And then the lowercase b is 4.8 squared plus lowercase c is 5.6 squared. If you swap these two numbers around, it doesn't matter. Minus 2, we put them again. Cos, and then the uppercase a is the angle. 20.4. Now one more thing, you see this square here, I move it to the other side, it becomes a square root. So that saves me time. I can now just put that into the calculator. Yeah, I've got a decimal point and I got math here, but fixed it. It's 2.0029 is the length. All right. Round it to three significant figures would simply be 2.00, which is nice. Makes good, reasonable answer. So we know that's two meters. Next, to tell us angle XBA is 64 degrees. XBA is this one. XBA is 64. Calculate AX. Right. Let's draw that triangle on the right here. So the triangle on the side there, which is triangle x b a this one's got a 90 degree angle we now know this is two meters we just calculated and they told us this is 64 okay and they now know what is a x okay so as i said before we got a right angle triangle and we got an angle involved so we're going to use Sokatua. So what we need to do now, we need to label the sides. Okay. So first of all, there's the hypotenuse, the one right opposite the right angle. Then we got the side opposite the angle we have. This will be the opposite side. And then adjacent is right next to the angle we have. So we're not working with the hypotenuse now. We're working with the adjacent and we want to know the opposite. So we're looking at the O and the A, we're going to use Toa. Toa is ton. So we write ton, and then immediately an angle. The ratio is always followed by an angle. Okay. O is first, so that goes above the line, and that's the thing we want to know. So that would be AX over the adjacent, which we know is 2. So to find AX, we just need to rearrange this. We need to do two times ton 64 will be equal to A 
x. Let's check it. Let's just put it times in there. Now, what am I doing? 64. 4.1006. Three significant figures, that is 4.10. Let's check our answers. That was all correct. And 4.1, you don't need zero or any unrounded answer. Correct answer only. Okay, using the ton rule, you can also use the sin rule if you want. Part 3, they tell us AY is 2.9 meters. So AY, this one here, is 2.9. And they want us to find the area of the triangle. Okay. So, area of a triangle, there are two formulas. Okay. Alright. There is the classical half base times height and then there's also the half a b and c okay which one to use well if we got the height then the first one is better to use which we do because the height is the perpendicular height which makes a 90 degree angle with the base so that's pretty straightforward i mean there's only two marks so the area of a triangle will be half the base being 4.8 and the perpendicular height being 2.9 which they just gave to us okay let's do that then gives us 6.96 that's an exact answer don't round it straightforward this one no problems there part b we're not getting away from trigonometry in triangle pqr that is the big triangle pqr the big one M is the midpoint. Ah, okay. So that tells us that this length and that length is the same. Then it tells us RM is 8, PRM is 30, and that one 75. Calculate PQ. So they want us to work out the length of this whole line my goodness how many marks five well since that's the midpoint if we can find just the length of pm or mq we can double it and then we have the length of the whole line okay what else can we get from this triangle i have no idea what we can do let's just start with the basics i'm gonna find angle p m r see if that helps me Angle P M R is 180 minus 75, which is 105. Angles on a straight line. They don't ask for reasons, so you don't need to write it. Okay, so that means you got this one. That's 105. What else then? Well, we can find the angle over there which then will be angle MPR which again angles in a triangle is 180 so we subtract 105 and then what was that 30 so that will be 135 so that one must be 45 Okay, so remember, let's go again. Trigonometry. What do we know about trigonometry? Just in case you haven't looked at the previous question, is for right angle triangles, 
we use either Pythagoras or Sokatua. Okay. If we don't have a right angle triangle, we can use the sine rule. How do we know we can use the sine rule? Well, one very basic thing. If we've got an angle and the opposite side, then we can use the sine rule. Whereas we use the cosine rule when we have two sides and the angle in between or we have three sides but here clearly we have now an angle and the opposite side so meaning we can work out pm because we got the opposite angle to that okay now the sine rule, of course, you've got two versions. You've got the first version where you put the angle, the sine and the angle at the top. And you've got another version where you put the side at the top. Okay, you can use any one at any time. They both work. But I recommend to put the thing that you want at the top okay so if you want to know what the angle is you put sine at the top if you want to know what a side is you put that this just makes it easier when you rearrange stuff to okay so the one I'm going to use the sine rule is the a sin a over b sin b now the a's and the b's in my formula does not correspond to the letters in the triangle of course so but we first put what we want to know. We want to know this one, you're right? PM. So that goes at the top. PM over sin. The angle is the angle opposite that, which is 30 degrees. Then we take the side we have, which was the 8 over sin. The angle opposite that, 45. So to find the length of PM, I need to multiply the whole sin 30 on the other side. Because I'm moving the angle with the sin, I'm not doing the inverse of the sin. It's only when you split the sin and the angle, you do sin minus 1. You multiply all of that on the other side. And that's how we get the length of PM. No, you see that times eight it needs to be outside the bracket. Okay, my answer is four square root two. Very accurate, okay, but we uh, can write the digits five point six five six eight, etc. Now remember, this is only. This distance here, we want the whole PQ. So I'm going to write PQ is twice that. It's just easier to write 4 square root 2 than 5.6568. But on the calculator, it's still there. We just times it by 2. And then now we can write the answer 11.313. Uh, rounded to three significant figures. 11.3 correct answer okay they show all the marks as I described them we've done it five marks you genius okay again be careful that you don't round the answer before you double it because then you're outside the acceptable range so only round at the end Question 6a, we got cumulative frequency, which means we're adding numbers as we go along. Okay, these cars are all driving past a speed camera. 12 of them were going 70 kilometers per hour or less. 80 of them were going 46 kilometers per hour or less, which includes the 12, which were in less than 70. So if you do 46 minus 12, 
That's 34, 34. We're going between 70 and 80 kilometers per hour. Okay, and then it continues like that. And all 200 of the cars were going less than 120 kilometers per hour, which is all right, I guess, if you're on the highway. Good news. Draw the cumulative frequency graph. So we just need to plot these. Okay, I would very strongly recommend using a pencil. Okay, it reduces the stress of making mistakes. Uh, if you make a mistake, you just rub it out. And uh, need to be accurate, of course. Make sure you understand the scale. Okay, we're using the upper bound of the top interval, so 70 for the first interval and 12. Okay, there are 10 squares between 0 and 20, which means each square represents 2. Okay, so you have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. The first point is over there. And you continue as such. Right, and then we connect these with a nice smooth flowing curve. No using a ruler. Okay, but make sure you go through every point. Okay, cumulative frequency always have this smooth snaking curve. Okay, so you've got a little wobble there, but that should be all right. Mask him just says correct curve. Sorry, can't show you anything there. Right, part two says use your cumulative frequency diagram to find an estimate of the median. So use the graph and show that you use the graph. All right, median, of course, is the middle. So we've got 200 cars, the middle will be at 100. Okay, so the median will be here. So using the graph means you take your ruler and your pencil. Draw a line across, draw a line down, See, that one is too wonky, that's a little bit better. On the very horizontal axis, axis, there are 10 squares between each value, so each square counts 1, so mine I get 88. Okay, the mark scheme give you a interval to go between. So 88 is quite good. Anything from 87 to 89.5. Interquartile range. So for that, we will need the upper quartile and the lower quartile. And of course, subtract them to get the answer. The lower quartile being the lower half. Half of the lower half. So the bottom 25 percent so we've got 100 there lower quartile 100 half of 100 is 50 so that's the lower quartile let's use that again that's not straight is it okay mine looks like 80 yours might be slightly different that's the lower quartile. Upper quartile is the top 75%, top three quarters. The half of the top half, so if it's between 100 and 200, halfway there between would be 150. That would be the upper quartile. And my wonky line gives me about 94. I'm really struggling to do this on a screen. Okay, but be thorough. So I get 14 kilometers per hour. That means the middle 50% of the cars, the difference in speed there was only 14 kilometers per hour. Let's see if I'm right. Just made it within the bounds there. 14 is the top. All right, so 13, 12 and a half. And that's all good and there you can see the measurements for upper and lower quartile okay mm.
my measurements there for the lower quarter was slightly off to be very thorough I wasn't thorough enough definitely not okay common errors is misreading of the scale right so look carefully at the scale on the axis number of cars with a speed greater than 110 kilometers per hour means we go here okay so that means we need to go up till we meet the graph oh my goodness that's gonna be a long line uh, it's gonna be a tough one Two, four, six, eight, ten, hundred and ninety-three is my guess. Hundred and ninety-three. Now I was really struggling doing this. Oh, be careful though. That's not correct, of course. They say greater than. Greater than, yeah. So I got 193, and there's 200 cars. We need to subtract it. That will be seven. Okay, uh, here, they're not that strict, so follow through from your grass. Okay, so they don't like seven of seven is correct. You might have a, probably a better answer than I do. Okay, so remember to subtract it from 200. Okay, minus seven, but don't take my word for it. Look, my lines are not exactly straight. So I guess like six, seven, eight, I don't know. There's no exact answer. Question B. We're showing the mass of 50 trucks. Oh my goodness. Kilograms. So 12 of them weighs between 2 and 2.6 tons. That's the lightest ones. The heaviest ones weigh between 5 and 5.7 tons. And there's 7 of them. That's a lot of weight. Calculate an estimate for the mean mass of the truck. So what we need to do now, we need to take all those trucks, put them on one scale. I don't think your bathroom scale will work. You need a massive scale. Put them all on there. So we know how much they all weigh together. And then divide it by 50 because there's 50 trucks. So 50 trucks on one scale. We stack them up. Okay, unless you've got a massive scale the size of a massive parking lot. You can park them next to each other. Okay. That's one way of doing it. All right. Another way is using this table they gave us. The problem with this table is we don't know the exact weight of each truck. We only have a little indication. That's why it's an estimate. An estimate. Because we don't know the exact weight of each truck. We're going to we can take those first 12 trucks. And we're going to try and find out how much do they weigh all together. Now we don't know how much they weigh. So we're just going to assume that they weigh around halfway in that interval. More or less. If we have to work their average out. We will assume it will be halfway between 2,000 and 2,600. Which is 2,300 kilograms. Okay. Then we're going to add the next 15 trucks. We're going to add the weight. Which we will estimate is halfway between 2,600 and 3,500. What is in the middle between those two? If you don't know, add it together and divide it by 2. That will give us the exact midpoint without stressing too much. So, three thousand and fifty. That's the exact midpoint of those two so we estimate that those 15 trucks each weigh about three just over three tons the next 16 trucks halfway between 3,500 and 5,000 4,250 And the seven heaviest trucks, I'm sure that will be 5,350 because half of that, yeah. But it's always good to double check. Yeah, 
Yeah. Okay. So how much does all these trucks weigh? Let's now put it all into the calculator. Okay, so here it goes. Already I made a mistake, yeah? Putting a plus instead of a times. Very common mistake. So those 50 trucks, they weigh about 178,000. Eight hundred kilograms, which is one hundred seventy-eight tons. Then we need to divide all of that by how many trucks there is, which is fifty. So divide that by fifty, and I get three thousand five hundred and seventy-six kilograms. Now think three thousand five hundred. And 76 is around about here on this scale, right? Which is within the table, close to the middle. So it's a reasonable answer, okay? Always check if your answer is reasonable because if you put, like I did, a plus instead of a times at one point, then your answer will be way too low. So less than 2,000 or even less than 3,000, you know, it's too low. It must be wrong. Or if you put a times when you shouldn't have, it can be too big, and then you have to redo it. I think redo it twice anyway to double check if you don't have a mark scheme like I do. Okay, but luckily I got it right. Okay, so just check here, yeah. You get a mark for the midpoints, you get a mark for adding them together, you get a mark for dividing by 50, and that's a show all your working out because it's so easy to just press the wrong button. And then if there's no working out, no method, you get zero. Showing everything is important. Part two. And this is a histogram question without a histogram. I hate these questions. How can you do a histogram question without having a histogram? Which is very annoying, which makes it a lot harder because there's nothing to look at, nothing to work with. All right, so let's remind ourselves what a histogram looks like. Okay, histogram is a bar chart all right and at the bottom of this histogram we will have the weight or the mass of these trucks okay you will have the mass there in kilograms and on the vertical axis we will have the frequency density that's what you need to remember frequency density Okay, and then the histogram has bars. Okay, this is just an example. This is not how the actual one will look, what we're going to work with now. Okay, but you have bars, different heights, and different widths. Okay, that is, remember, what a histogram is. Okay, now remember the formula. Okay, the way I remember this is that always the frequency... This is now the number of trucks, the frequency, yeah? Is the area of the bar. And what's the area of a bar? The bar is just a rectangle. It's the class width. How wide this is. Class width. Times, because it's length times, base times height or length times width. It's a rectangle. Uh, the frequency density. Or you want to draw your triangle, okay, you put the frequency at the top, class with its CW times frequency density FD, okay. Remember that, that's good. So what do they want to know? Calculate the heights of the bars. Now the heights of the bars is the frequency density so the height that is frequency density so we want to know frequency density we need to do the frequency divided by the class 
width okay so for example for the first block they call them blocks okay blocks for the first one we have a frequency of 12 and we have a class width of 600 200 to 600 now this is now the class width so 12 divided by 600 this is silly uh, insane so 12 divided by 600 gives us 0 0.02 But that is not how they make the bar. How they made the bar uh, six centimeters high. So that means how do we get from 0 0.02 to six? There's to six divided by 0 0.02. Then multiplying it by 300 to get the height of the bar. So for the second block we have a frequency of 15 right and we got a class width what is that 900 so what does that work out zero point zero one six recurring so if we want to know the height of the bar we need to do, keep doing the same thing, multiply it by 300. And that is five centimeters. I love it, such a beautiful whole right, number. Five centimeters. So, we got two more blocks to go. Okay. The next block is 16, and that is 1,500. So we do 16 over 1,500. zero point zero one zero six recurring multiplied by three hundred three point two centimeters and the last one seven class width is seven hundred Seven divided by seven hundred is zero point zero zero one, isn't it? Zero point zero one. What did I say? I said anyway. Three centimeters. Okay. So yeah, my, my Instagram is wrong. The first bar is the highest, and then they go lower. So my bar there is wrong. Anyway, 5, 3.2, and 3. There is the division you need to do, and the multiplier being 300. We've done it. Okay, the one thing I didn't do quite that well, I kept, it's better to keep the frequency density as fractions, rather than decimals. That's what I, I did it as decimals. But I kept it on my calculator and I didn't round them because uh, if you round those decimals, then you get inaccurate answers. They want accurate answers. Okay, so be careful with the decimals. Don't round them. Better to use fractions. Well, we're on to question seven. And A, they just want us to identify the graph. So let's look at the different types of graphs there is. Okay, first of course, you've got the linear graph, which is in the form of y equals mx plus C then we get a quadratic graph which always has got a square sum in there where a equals a x squared plus B x plus C then we get the cubic graphs that's when we get the nice wavy thing going on anything with a cube in it in the form of a x cubed plus B x squared plus C x 
plus D, you could say. Then we get the exponential graphs where the X is a power. And lastly, the reciprocal where the X was as a denominator. Okay, so looking at these, I think that the one that we can see similarities with is this one, of course, the cubic graph. So here we have a cubic graph. Yes, circle that. Cubic it is. Part B, you see now we got that reciprocal graph there, which I showed you before. This one here. But how are we going to draw it? Okay. If you are not sure how to draw these, you don't remember the shape, you can always just draw yourself a little table. Okay. And that will help you to remember what the stuff looks like. Okay. Let's just, just do a few here. So, <clears throat> always good to have a few negative values. Let's do minus 4, minus 2, 0, 1, 2, 4. And then we just put the values in. So I picked the x values. So to get the y, we're going to use just this part to get the y and change the x value each time. So that will be 1 over 2 brackets. So that is negative 4. We'll get negative an eighth. Okay. Change it to a 2. We get negative a quarter. It will give you the idea that it gets very close to the, the horizontal axis, okay? And then this one is important, okay? When x is 0, it gets you that math error, which means this is not possible. x cannot be 0. It tells you that there is an asymptote. There's a line that cannot be crossed, okay? And then as we go... <clears throat> Let's go back. Uh, we can change that for a one. That would be a half. Change it for a two. That would be a quarter, of course. And that would be an eighth. Okay, this will help you to remember kind of what it looks better as some touch, but you're gonna have to study the shape of these graphs. Okay, it just tells you when x is negative, y is negative. Okay, so that tells us the graph is gonna come this way and turn. Make sure, okay, and when x is positive, y is positive. So the same thing here. Make sure you don't touch the y-axis, okay, as this, or the x-axis for that matter. Yeah, there it is. If it crosses the x or the y-axis, or even touches it, I guess, then you're going to lose a mark. Okay, so be careful. Okay, something we need to study, yeah, because a higher than average made no attempt at response at all. So definitely go study these. And I've got an idea when they say these things people don't study it. Those are the questions they put in again, yeah? So the next one, solve the equation. Right, how could we do this? If we had an accurate graph, we gotta try to use that, but we don't have an accurate graph. The first thing I will do is get rid of the fractions. We multiply the 2x on that side. So you get 1 equals 2x times 2x. 2x times 2x, 2 times 2 is equal to 4, and x times x is x squared. Now to get rid of that uh, 4, we divide it, that gives us 1 quarter equals x squared. And the last thing would make the square root of 1 quarter. Okay, now then we need two answers, alright? And this is where we need to remember that when we square root something, like square root 4, the calculator will tell us it's 2, but we need to know, of course, it's 2 because 2 times 2 is 4, but minus 2 times minus 2 is also 4. That's why we get a positive and a negative answer. So with this one here, the square root of 1 quarter, okay, uh, you can put it in your calculator if you're unsure about anything, you can't remember it, but I'm sure you do. The square root of 1 quarter, that's a half, of course. All right. But just like before, 
minus a well, half times a half is a quarter that's why it works but minus a half times minus a half is also a quarter that's why we got the positive and the negative answer right not from wrong working i don't know what wrong working you can show there there's the working 40 squared equals one yeah so you need to show the method marking not from wrong working again so show the working out and i'm going to give you the, the marks using the difference of two squares of course that's another way of doing it okay you rearrange it you move the one over there that gives you 4x squared minus 1 equals 0 which we can then do the difference of two squares if you square with that that's 2x and 2x because 2x and 2x is 4x squared and then 1 times 1 1 needs to be negative the other one positive and that's why we have number two term that means 2x minus 1 equals 0 2x equals 1 x equals a half 2x plus 1 equals zero that means 2x equals minus one and x equals minus a half that's another way using the difference of two squares if you've done it that way brilliant as well question c ask us to draw a sketch of the sin graph if you remember what this looks like if you study great if you're not sure uncertain forgot you can always put this in your calculator sin zero what is that well that's zero so we know the graph is going to go through zero okay uh, remember halfway here we got 90 degrees so you can put in sin 90 and then okay at 90 degrees my graph needs to be at 1 and we can just continue doing that sin 180 gives me 0 halfway here it's 270 so sin 270 minus one and yes now you should remember the shape by now but sin 360 zero again okay smooth curve make sure it goes through 180 and we're back at 360 there so they know what it looks like you so they know that you know what it looks like yeah so those points are important 0 0 180 0 360 with a maximum min minimum of minus one at least one cycle okay uh, be careful that you don't go too high above one or minus one and it didn't start at the origin you should probably do the cost graph next we're solving this equation first thing we will do keep the equal in the middle move the one to the other side so that becomes minus one so we got three sin x equals minus one next is we divide by three so that gives us minus a third and the last step is we separate that sin from its angle so we do the inverse of sin and minus a third let's see what that gives us so you press shift sin That minus, you can put it in front of the fraction, at the top or the bottom, that doesn't matter. And we get minus 19.471. Etc. Don't round the answer yet. We're not sure if that's the final answer. So at least four significant figures. All right, now look carefully, ladies and gentlemen. This is not what we were looking for. We were looking for an answer between 0 and 360. Well, our answer is negative, so we are not there. There's not one of the two answers they're looking for because we are smaller than zero. So what has happened here? Okay, remember this graph continues on this side that way. So if we look at this step over here, sin x equals minus a third. Okay, minus a third being well, third between zero and one. So minus a third would be over here somewhere. Meaning if we go across from there and then up, you will get that answer our calculator has given us, which is minus 19.5 roughly. Okay. Now, if we go across from where we cross the graph this way, you will see we cross the graph one, 
two more times. So to find the next answer, we're going to have to look here and here. Okay. Good news is that that distance, the whole thing is symmetrical. So the distance from zero to this answer we got here, okay, this distance here, there, from zero to minus, minus 19.5, isn't that the distance? That being symmetrical will be the same over here and the same over there. That distance stays the same. So we want our other answers. We simply need to do here 180 plus 19.5. Or 19.471 etc of course what would that be a hundred and ninety nine point four seven one okay angles if you're gonna round them you round them always to one decimal place so there being a seven we round that to a five so hundred and ninety nine point five degrees nice is between zero and three sixty and the other answer over here, we need to subtract it from 360. So we do 360 minus 19.471. Okay, I don't want to mess this up. So we just do, well, let's make this answer positive. Okay, so I'm going to do 360 minus the previous answer, 340. 528 again we have uh, one decimal place there's a two so that stays a five so 340.5 let's have a look what well, at least 190.5 or rounded more significant figures and uh, 340.5 and the rest doesn't matter okay if you got uh, one mark for rearranging your equation and or two marks if you got two correct for one correct answer all right use your graph to check your answers and you can check it on your calculator Let me, let's do that for a moment there okay so um, again we're gonna use this all right send the angle I gave the answer for should equals negative a third. Or if we use this, we can use this well. The answer should be close to zero. Okay. Let's do that. Let's do the first one. So th three sin. Now I said one of my answers was 199.5. And then I need to add one. Now our answer should be close to zero because I reused the rounded answer. So it won't be exactly zero, but yep that is close to zero okay of course if we put more digits there four seven one i get closer and closer to the correct answer same if i check the other one 340 340.528 should be close to zero yeah so i know it's correct you're gonna ace this test yes you are on to question eight. We're selling shirts and jackets. Let's write this down, the information. Right, so they are shirts and they are jackets. The shirts cost X dollars and the jackets cost $27 more because it's X plus 27. The shop shells four shirts and three jackets. Where I down and solve an equation, and an equation has got an equal sign to find the cost of one shirt. Right, so imagine if one shirt costs ten dollars, we need to do four times ten to see how much we paid for that's forty dollars, right? So we need to do four times X gives us the price we pay for four shirts. Okay. Because it was ten dollars, we do four times ten. To put the jackets, right? If we want to know how much we pay for three jackets, remember we need to do. I said a shirt was ten, so a jacket would be ten plus twenty-seven, thirty-seven. You need to do three times thirty-seven. 
Okay, but we don't know, so we're just going to do 3 times x plus 27. Now, the total we paid for 4 shirts and 3 jackets was 194.75. We need to add it together. Okay, remember, they said write down an equation. You have to write this down if you want your marks, because they told you to. Now, now we need to solve it. All right. So, first thing I can do there, I can expand the bracket, keep things organized and clear, right? 3 times 27 is 54 plus 27 is, uh, what is that, 81, yeah, it's 81, but don't waste your brain power. Use your calculator, make sure you stay on track. We can add the x's together, 4x plus 3x is 7x. Next step would be to subtract 81. So let's do that. So 7x is 113.75. So the last step would be to divide that 7. Sixteen dollars twenty-five. X, of course, is sixteen, but the price of a shirt is just X, and they ask for the price of one shirt. That should be correct. Okay, so important to write down the equation to get that first mark, and then correct answer only for full mark sixteen twenty-five. Nothing else. Don't round it, right? Because it's an exact answer. So don't write it to three significant figures. Okay. Next, we're solving simultaneous equations. Now, they put that x squared in there just to be annoying. Isn't that annoying? Okay. If you look down here, we need four answers, okay? Because the quadratic equation always has two answers how to do this now there are many ways to do simultaneous equations um i think what a lot of people would probably want to try is because they're lined up so nicely you know those y's is lined up so nicely not like that okay that the y's is, and the equal signs are lined up why do want to think of doing the elimination method? Okay. Thing is, though, we need to have the same coefficient in front of the y, which we don't. So what you would might want to do is multiply this one by 4, which would give us 5x times 4 is 20x. Remember, you have to multiply everything. 4 times y is 4y. And minus 8 times 4 is minus 32. Right, I'm just going to take that first equation and write it right above there again. Okay, so why did I do that? Why did I multiply before? Because now these two terms are the same, which means if we subtract the second equation from the first one, I will eliminate the 4y which is great because then I'll be left with just the x and then I can solve it. Now x minus 20x is x minus 20x. We cannot subtract x's from x squares. Okay, you can multiply, divide them, but you can't subtract them. So that stays the same. 4y minus 4y is 0. That's what we wanted. It's gone. And then be careful, yeah, because there are a minus here and a minus there. Those are two minuses. Two minuses makes a plus. So this is going to be 37 plus 32, which will give me 71. Is that correct? No, that's not 71, it's 69. Man. Okay, 69. Yeah, because 30 is 69. Positive 69, because 2 minus makes a plus. Right, so you should recognize we've got a quadratic equation, two answers. So 
we're going to move the 69 over there, which gives me x squared minus 20x minus 69 equals 0. Okay. So, how do we do this? There are different ways. There's completing the square, there's the quadratic formula, and there's factorizing. Now, a little tip here, if they wanted us to use the quadratic formula, they would say we need to round our answer to three significant figures, or one decimal place, or two different places. But the fact that they haven't told us makes me think that we might have whole number answers. So, I'm going to go and try and factorize this. Okay. Now, we need to think of two numbers that we multiply together to get 69 and that we add together to get negative 20. Oh, and negative 69. So, what two numbers do we multiply to get 69? Okay, let's do it the opposite way. Let's do 69 divided by 3. I like that. 3 and 23. 3 times 23. 69. I start at 3 because 6 and 9, they go so nicely. Can't be divided by 3, so I don't. So that looks good because 3 times 23 is 69. And somehow I'm sure we can manipulate 3 and 23 to give us minus 20. And how are we going to do that? Well, we just need a negative 23. 3 minus 23 gives us a negative 20. So... 3 times minus 23 gives me minus 69. Bam, it's done. So my two factors are these numbers, a positive 3 and a negative 23. Okay, it's going well. Just double check it. There's nothing wrong, right? X times X is X squared. 3 times minus 23 is minus 69. Uh, x times minus 23 is minus 23, 3 times x is plus 3x, minus 23x plus 3x gives you minus 20. All right, now we split it up into x plus 3 and x minus 23. We set them both equal to 0. So that's where they cross the y-axis. Move that 3 across. We got one answer. x is minus 3. Move the minus 23 across, it becomes positive. X is positive 23. And all feels good. All right. Next step would be to find the Y. I think I want to use this equation. You can use any equation, but this one doesn't have that square. It looks a little bit easier for me to use it. Okay. So, if X is... What do we have? Minus 3. Put that into that question. So 5 instead of x, we put minus 3. Plus y is minus 8. That will give us minus 15. So that means y is... Move this to the other side. Becomes a plus... 15 minus 8 is 7. So that is 7. Okay. And the other one was x is 23. So we use that equation. 5 times 23 plus y equals minus 8. What's 5 times 23? 115. Move it to the other side. That will give us minus 100. And 23. Check it with your calculator. You can always check if everything is correct. Okay. Use the first equation. Okay. I'm going to use that first equation to check my answer. If you've got time on the exam. It's a smart thing to do. Use the other equation. And if it's correct, then it's good. So, if x is minus 3, we need to do minus 3 squared in brackets plus 4 y was 7 if this gives me 37 then I know it's correct yes so that's a correct answer the other one we had x is 23 
then y was negative 123. This gives me 37. I know that answer is correct. And yes, don't even have to check the mark scheme. Okay, to know that I've got it all correct. Final answer. Okay, that could have used the quadratic formula to do it. The method they use first seems to be the method. There's other ways where you do y squared. I can spend all day showing you every single method. There's the factorizing. You can factorize the y's. All right, this again, yes. As candidates were asked to show all working, they were expected to show the method for solving the quadratic. So just showing that factorization or showing how you use the quadratic formula, you need to do that to get your marks. You need to show everything if you want full marks. Oh my goodness, this is again when they tell you what a cow looks like and then ask you how to get to the moon, isn't it? Let's draw this out. Okay. A solid cylinder, let's draw that, a solid cylinder. What is a solid cylinder? Like a bar. Okay. It's got a radius of x and a height of 6x. A sphere, I like to draw a sphere. You go like this and then you make it shiny. Okay. Of radius r, has got the same surface area as the total surface area of the cylinder. So, let's do work out the total surface area of the cylinder. Okay, remember what a cylinder is. A cylinder is simply two circles and a curved face. That's why it starts by doing twice the area of a circle. Those are the two circles. Pi r squared, twice because it's two circles, one to the bottom. Then you need to add to it the area of the curved thing. Okay, where it's just a rectangle, where the height, h, that's just the height of the cylinder. And then this length here is the same as the circumference of the circle, because when you fold it, it will go around. So that's two pi r. So that's two pi r, h. Okay, remember this formula, but if you can envision where it comes from, it's not that difficult to remember. So, what do we know, what do we have there? We know, well, x, r is x, and the height is 6x, so let's put that in. So, we got 2 pi, now instead of r, let's put x, and then 2 pi, and x again, and the height is 6x. Let's see if we can simplify this thing. Okay, so that's easy, 2 pi x squared, I just took the brackets away, and then 2 pi x times 6x, of course, is uh, 6x squared. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Because it's, everything is being multiplied together. 2 times pi times 6 times x. We can multiply the 2 and the 6. That will give us 12 pi x squared. And because this is equivalent, same uh, terms, they are the same. They both have a pi and an x squared. So they're the same, yeah? It's like saying I've got two buckles, two... Two apples and 12 apples, I can add them together. That will give us 14 apples or 14 pi x squares or 14 x squares pi's. We can work out 14 pi, of course, and get a long decimal answer, but um, that will be counted. Yeah. I'm going to leave it at that for now. Let's go over to the sphere. So, the total surface area of a sphere is gave it to us 4 by r squared okay now is there anything we can change there no because the r is the r yeah they said the radius is r we already have an r for the radius 
So, the only thing that's left to do, because they told us that it has the same surface area, is to set them equal to each other. So, 4 pi r squared equals 14 pi x squared. Now, where are we going with this? Let's have a look up here. They got the r squared alone. Okay. So that means I'm going to take the 4 pi and divide it on the other side. So r squared equals 14 pi x squared divided by 4 pi. Okay, nice. Because pi divided by pi, that cancels out. And 14 and 4, if we divide both by 2, it will give us 7 x squared over 4. Uh, 2, over 2, of course. Because you divide 4 by 2, you get 2. Uh, oh, and they got the x squared just... You can have the x squared at the top or next to it. doesn't matter. That's the same thing. Okay. Uh... There we go, exactly like I said. Set it equal to each other. And then at least one full stage of working, which I've done that, like this one over here. Okay. And you've done it. Funny thing I see, some uh, students struggle to differentiate between the variable x and them. So they write an x and then they think it's a time sign and you get mixed. Oh my good, don't do that. That's a silly thing to do. Confusing your x with the times. That's why you keep it clear, methodical, correct, so you don't get confused. Make your x look different from your multiplication side. All right, that was an interesting tidbit. Right, question nine. Question nine, let's write the information they give us carefully. This is a square in the middle. And the two sectors on the side is the same size. The square, it's 11 centimeters, which means this is 11, that is 11. Now, this is a sector, so that's the center of a sector, okay? Which means that's a radius, BC is a radius, which means CN will also be 11, okay? And the same here, that would be 11, because it's the radius of a circle. Those things are all 11. Right, we need to get the area of the shape. So let's first do the area of the square would simply be 11 times 11 is 121. Okay. Then, well, there are different ways to do this. Let's do the area of the sector. Okay. So why do you think they told us MAB, DC, and our straight lines? This is just to make it clear, right? That this is 90, that is 90. Okay, because if they didn't say it, you could maybe assume it's not. So they had to make it clear. So you got a circle, cut it like this. That's 90. That is clearly a quarter of a circle. Okay, you can use the formula for the area of a sector which is the angle over 360 times the area of a pi r squared which will give you 90 over 360 times pi r squared the 90 over 360 is simply a quarter okay so it's a quarter of a circle times pi the radius being 11 that will give the area of one sector so it is we got a quarter of a circle times pi times 11 squared of course don't forget to square okay so there we go 95.0331 okay but there are two and they're exactly the same so it's two so you need to just double that Okay, so in the end, it's really it's the area of a semicircle, which shows that in the end, I was wasting time. I could have just multiplied it by a half and get them both together. But anyway, so I need to double this answer to get them both together. I pressed the wrong button there. Okay, 
which is 190.0663 and then to that we need to add the area of the square Three hundred and eleven. If you're going to round it to three significant figures, three hundred and eleven. Rounded answer good. Unrounded also good. Okay, and show all your working. Forget the method marks. Next one is the perimeter of the shape. So this is now where you need to imagine that you are walking. On the edge of this shape so let's start here okay I'm gonna walk from M to A from A to B that will be of course be a length of 22 then we need to walk the length of this arc now remember the formula for the uh, length of an arc or arc length the same as the area of a sector, you need to take the formula for the circumference of a circle, which is pi d, or better, because we're working with the radius, 2 pi r. And again, this time, we only have a quarter of a circle, or uh, 90 degrees over 360. That doesn't matter, okay. So, let's do that. Don't square it. We're doing circumference. Okay, so there we go. 11 over 2 pi. Okay, now I can write all of these digits. That's a lot, but 11 over 2, well, that's 5.5 pi. So I'm just going to write 5.5 pi. Okay, this just makes it easier and more accurate. But you can write the other answer if you want. Just don't round it yet. You can write 17.278. Okay, so well, we've gone down. Now we need to go from N to D. That will be another 22. And then there's another arc, which is the same as the last arc. And we're back where we started. So that will be another 5.5 pi. Which in the land is 11 pi, is it not? Anyway, so let's do that. 22 plus 5.5 pi plus 22 plus 78.5575. Going to round this three significant figures. There's a five, so we need to round that up to a six. 78.6 beautiful rounded or unrounded answer show all you're working out to get full marks question b we have a cube with the edge of seven so that's seven that's seven everything is seven right calculate the angle between a g and the base of the cube so let's first draw a line from a to g and the base means the base A, B, C, D. So that forms for us a right angle triangle, like so. Okay. Let me draw that triangle over here. This is triangle A, G, C. So right angle triangle, and we got the height seven there. That's all we have at this moment. Okay, let's not make any assumptions. I don't have enough information there. But I do see another triangle lying flat on the ground there. Okay, that's another triangle. I'm going to draw that triangle over here. This triangle, triangle ABC, it's also a right angle triangle. And now we got AB and BC, AB being 7 and BC being 7. Okay, 
So remember trigonometry. Yeah, when we got right angle triangles and we're working with the sides only, we can use Pythagoras. If we're working with a right angle triangle and there are any angles involved, and sides of course, then we use Sokatoa. Okay, but first over here we can work AC because AC is in both sides. See that? So I'm gonna do Pythagoras. AC squared equals AB squared plus BC squared. So to work out AC, uh, we can do the square root, moving that square across, and those are both 7 squared. Okay, let's put that into our calculator. Okay, we can write 9.8994, don't round it, but this is more accurate for me. 7 square root 2, keeping it in third form is a more accurate unrounded answer. Okay, so that means now we got the 7 square root 2 we got that length okay on this triangle here 7 square root 2 okay so I'm back to the light green triangle uh, we need to find the angle between AG and the base that's going to be this angle here angle GAC GAC is this angle here that's what we need to find Okay, so like I said, once there is an angle involved, we can't use Pythagoras. We now need to use Sokatua, so we need to label the sides, okay? First of all, the hypotenuse is opposite the right angle. Opposite the angle, we have the opposite side, and right next to the angle, we got the adjacent. We're not using the hypotenuse, we're going to find out the opposite, and we got the adjacent, so that means we're using 2R. Okay, so let's do that. 2R means we write tan, and then the angle, don't have the angle, I'm going to call it CAG, because we go from C to A to G. Okay. Um, the O being first in the ratio means we put that at the top, which we got, that is 7. And then the adjacent goes bottom, which we have a 7 square root 2. So we want to know what angle CAG is. We're going to move that ton over, which means we need to use the inverse, minus 1. Okay, I'm sure you can see that the two sevens will cancel, but let's not take any chances. Let's leave it as it is. 7 over 7 square root 2. Close the bracket. 35.264, etc. Okay. We write the size of an angle, we do it to one decimal place. This is a six, so we round that up to a three. So it's 35.3 degrees. 35.2 or three. Oh God, my heart stopped there for a moment. So they're quite lenient. Okay, I think my answer is the most accurate. But they seem to have been uh, quite lenient actually. They lie, they allow you to have a range of answers which is weird okay um, there is other ways of doing it you can work out the length of AG the hypotenuse by doing the formula for the diagonal of a three-dimensional shape simply meaning you can find AG by doing the square root of 7 squared plus 7 squared plus 7 squared that maybe is a bit quicker Okay, and then you're going to use the cost rule to find it. I'm not going to go through all of that. I've tried to use the one that's maybe more familiar, but that would be quicker if you got it. Okay, 
Again, be careful with premature rounding. Don't round till the end. Question 10. We are back to reciprocal graphs. Okay, so we're going to have to put this into our calculator. So we got 2 to the power of. First one, we got an x value of negative 1 there. Use the arrows to go down, minus 3. Okay, decimals or fractions, whichever you prefer. I think if it gets complicated, well, it's going to be easier to plot the decimals, isn't it? Okay, let's go with decimals. Minus 2 and a half. Oh, yes, it's already decimals. Let's stick with decimals. Okay, let's change that. 0, the 1 for a 0. I think you know this one. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. And then 1 minus 3 is minus 2. Next one, again, anything to the power of 1 stays the same. 2 minus 3 is 1, minus 1. Oh, see, that's why we use a calculator. Okay, all right, so that, we got those, good. Next step would, of course, be to plot it on the grid. Use your pencil and be accurate. And remember, along the corridor, up the stairs or down the stairs. Okay, and then with a freehand smooth curve going through every point. Okay, remember, don't do feathering, which means you go like this, or draw a line, see it's wrong, draw another line. Yeah, one straight smooth line. That's why you use a pencil, rub it out, be accurate. Don't be sloppy, you don't want to use marks for no reason. Smooth curves, that's what we're looking for. Part C says use your graph to solve the equation 2x. Uh, look what's changed here. Okay, they have changed what is equal to. Here it's equal, the equation is equal to 2. Here the exact equation, same equation, is equal to y. So what does that mean? y has now changed to a 2. So y equals 2. Okay, meaning we need to use our graph, we need to draw a line that goes through y equals 2. That would be a horizontal line that goes through the y-axis at 2. Okay, that's the line, y equals 2. Alright, so to solve it, we need to see what is the x value from where they cross. So we go from there and we go down. And there. Minus 2.1, 2.2, 2.35. That's my opinion. 2.35. If my graph is accurate enough. Let's see what they say. Between 2.3 to 2.4. I'm bang in the middle. I know, I know. I'm just I'm a genius. Okay, 2.3 will be correct, 2.4 will be correct. Okay, then question D, they up the ante, they make it a little bit harder. So, the equation they give us is 2x minus x minus 1.5 equals 0. Can't do anything with that equation. What we want is we want the equation that we've drawn so we can use the graph. So we need to move from that to... Uh, 2x minus 3. Okay. We need to change 2x minus x minus 1 fifth to 2x minus 3. Then we can use the graph. If we got what the graph is on the one side of the equal, what's on the other side is what we need to draw. Okay. So if we are going to change that first equation to the second one, we're going to have to get rid of the x. So we're going to have to add an x. So minus x plus x, there's no x on the left. Okay, but with all equations, we need to do the same on both sides. Okay, then if we want to change minus 1.5 to minus 3, we're going to subtract another 1.5. We need to do the same over here. Okay, so, meaning, right, we got 2x, 2x stays 2x. 
we've done the plus x, minus x plus x. There's no x's left like we wanted to. And the minus 1.5 minus 1.5 gives us minus 3. So we need to do the same on the other side, which we did. So it's 0 plus x is x. 0 minus 1.5 is 1.5. Okay. So what we need to do now is we need to draw this line here. Y equals X minus 1.5. Oh my goodness, what does that line look like? What does the line Y, X minus 1.5? It's not difficult to do. Okay, we just need to pick a few values and then draw that. Let's do this in here. Okay, so let's just pick a few values. If x is 0 then y is 0 minus 1.5 so y is minus 1.5 so it will go through minus one and a half on the y-axis if x is 1 then 1 minus one and a half is minus a half isn't it so it goes through minus a half if x is 2, then y equals 2 minus 1.5, then y is a half. Okay, a half is there. Now I've done three points. You see they are in a straight line like they're supposed to be. So now we can draw a line as accurately as possible. Now the good news is it crosses my graph in two places and we need two answers. Okay, first one here, nice and easy, minus one. Okay, and the second one there, if we go down, what is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like 1.65. Minus 1 is correct, minus 1.65, anything between 1.55 and 1.75, excellent. And there is the ruled line you need to draw. It was a hard question, high proportion of candidates did not try it. Uh, be careful for not being accurate enough work very carefully and accurately so here we are in question 11 they give us two coordinates 4 1 and minus 2 minus 7 so let's have a look what that looks like 4 1 would be over there <clears throat> and they think they called it m and minus 2 minus 7 would be there and that they called n is it m n okay <clears throat> which will give us this line let's draw the ruler the line there goes the line and they want us to find the length of this line so you've got a ruler you can measure it if the square is over one centimeter but the other way of doing that is by drawing a right angle triangle. Okay, because then what we got is, of course, A right angle triangle, which we can do Pythagoras with. Okay, we just need the length of the sides. If we got, like the base of this triangle goes from minus 2 to 4, and that is 6. 6 units, 6 squares, we can count them. And the height goes from minus 7 up to 1, that would, of course, be 8. Yeah, we can count the squares. All that's left to do is doing Pythagoras. So the length of mn 
would be the square root of 8 squared and 6 squared. <clears throat> okay. Easy as that. We got the answer. Now, yeah, easy if you got a grid. Don't have a grid, what do you do? Well, you can drive, draw yourself a little grid. Or you can remember the formula for the length of a line. Okay. And the formula simply comes from that. It's square root because we're doing Pythagoras. And then we take x2 minus x1, which will give us that horizontal uh, length, which we got as 6. And y2 minus y1, which will give us the vertical length, which was 8. So to do that, we need to label the coordinates. Let's call this x1 and that x2 and this y1 and that y2. All right, so we take x2, which is a negative 2, and we subtract from that 4, okay, which will give us negative 8. Now remember to keep this in brackets, because remember, 8 squared and negative 8 squared gives you the same answer if you keep it inside a bracket, you know? 8 squared, 64, negative 8 squared, oh, in brackets, 64. Okay, if you're going to do it without the brackets, you're going to get negative 64, which is wrong. Okay, so let's do the y's. y2 was negative 7, and we subtract from that 1. Uh, oh my goodness, look at that. It was 6. This one is the negative 8. Okay. Anyway, now it's correct. So, when we work this out, I mean, it doesn't matter if you put 6 squared or negative 6 squared. You can just 8 squared. doesn't matter. As long as that, if you put a negative in brackets, the answer is 10. Okay. 10 is the answer. Okay, uh, they had the coordinates the other way around, which would just give you two positive answers. If you swap the minus two and the minus four around, you can swap the, uh, you, you still get the right answers because it's six squared minus six squared. Okay, just be careful when you do swap around, you got a negative, two negatives, it makes it positive. Okay, next one is the gradient. Okay, again, let's go back here, look at what the gradient is. Now remember, gradient is the change in y over the change in x. Change in y here, the up and down, that's 8. Change in x, we're going horizontally, 6. So the gradient simplified is 4 over 3. Meaning for every 3 squares you go to the right, you go 4 squares up. Easy if you got the grid. If you don't, then let's use the formula. Okay, to find the gradient, you need to do now, remember, it's the y at the top, so y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Keeping up with the theme we had before, y2 is minus 7, so minus 7 minus 1, and below the line is minus 2 minus 4. Gives me minus 8, over minus 6. Two negatives becomes a positive. Simplify it 4 over 3. Same thing. 4 over 3 or 1 and a third or 1.3 recurring. They're happy with 4 over 3 or 8 over 6. Again, they got it the other way around. Remember, if you're going to swap the x's around, you have to swap the y's around, but you'll get the same answer. Let me show you what I mean. Okay. <clears throat> if we're going to do minus 1 um, minus minus 7 over minus 4 subtracting the negative 2 okay uh, no this is not right what am I doing we're swapping it around we're doing minus 7 oh, I'm putting the 1 first there's a positive 1 let's do that again that will be 1 minus a negative 7 and 4 minus a negative 2. 2 negatives makes a positive. You get 8 over 6. Same answer.
Question C, we need to find the equation of the perpendicular bisector of MN. Okay, remember the equation of a line is Y equals MX plus C. You need to write an equation. So you need to have the Y equals, there is your answer. Right, perpendicular bisector. Bi means two, like a bicycle. Sector means parts. So that's a line that cuts that line MN in two equal parts and it's perpendicular, which means it cuts at a 90 degree angle. Let's see if we can get that right. So, cut it in half. Is that a 90 degree angle? It's a line, something like this. I don't know if that's accurate enough. Looks like it goes through the middle, doesn't it? And it looks like it's a 90 degree angle. I'm not sure yet. We'll see as we go along. 90 degree with those two sides. Correct. Okay. So, what do we need to find out from this line? There's quite a few things looking at the question. Four marks. Okay. We are going to need the gradient the gradient of that line. Okay, now we got the gradient of the previous one. It's four over three. Okay, because for every three squares we go to the right, we go four squares up. That's why I got a gradient four over three. Okay, so what's the gradient of this new line? Okay. Let's see, for every four squares, we go to the left. We can say that's minus four. We go three squares up. See now, that one was positive. The new line will be negative. And we've swapped around the X and the Y, the horizontal and the vertical chain. So the new gradient will be minus three over four. Okay. Without a graph, we can simply write it down. Okay, the gradient of the first line was 4 over 3. To find the gradient of a perpendicular line, we invert it, get the reciprocal, and we put a minus in front. So that means now we got the grade equation y equals a third. How do I say a third and write a quarter? A th three quarters x plus c that's it minus three quarters so we can put that part in there okay see we're already picking up the marks the next we need to find where this graph cuts the y-axis okay so just clear a bit of the clutter Where does it cross there? Okay, it looks like it's at minus two and a third. That's what I guess. But you won't have a graph to help you. So this part will be a little bit less, a little bit more difficult. Okay. To continue from here, we need an X and a Y value. If we can put an X and a Y value and then we can work out C, which is the Y intercept which I think is minus two and a third, looking at the graph, but we're gonna work it out now. Do I have a point on that line? Yes, we got this point here. I can clearly see that is one minus three. Okay, but how do I find one minus three without the graph, without having that? Okay, what else do we know about that point? That point is in the middle of MN. It halves the line. Okay, how do I find the middle? Well, we've got a formula for that. Okay, to find the midpoint of a line, and that's a coordinate, so the formula is in the form of a coordinate, we need to add the two x values together and half it, add the two y values together and half it. That will give me the middle of the line. So let's have a look. The two x values of the points is 4 and minus 2. 
4 and minus 2, and then we have the 4 minus 2 is 2, 2 divided by 2 is 1. The two y values is minus 7 and 1, 1 and minus 7. So 1 plus minus 7, 1 minus 7 is of course 6, 6 divided by 2 is 3. Be careful, there will be minus 6, 1 minus 7 is minus 6, minus 6 divided by 2 is minus 3. Is that not what we said? Yes, that is the middle. Remember your formulas. Did this because now I got an x and a y value, which I can substitute into my equation here. So y is minus 3, x is 1. Okay, minus 3 quarters times 1 is minus 3 quarters. We need to move the three quarters to the other side. It becomes plus. So what's minus three plus three quarters? Yes, that's minus two thirds. But check it out. Minus three plus <coughs> three quarters is minus two and a quarter. I said a third. So I was slightly off. But let's leave it as minus nine over four. Okay. So that is the y-intercept minus 9 over 4, which we looked at the graph. Yeah, that could be. I thought it was a third, but it's, it's a quarter. My line is not perfect. And we got the answer. Let's see if we're right. Minus a third. Okay. Well, if you want to get rid of the fractions, you multiply everything by 4. You'll get that answer. Okay. Bit weird. <clears throat> okay careful that you lose a mark if you don't write the y equals because they want an equation write the y equals okay you get a mark for the midpoint you get a mark for the gradient yeah so basically want to get your marks uh, the gradient is one the midpoint is one two marks for everything in the right place <clears throat> Study this quarter geography. Lots of students didn't even try this question. Okay, so make sure to study it. Question 12 find the derivative. So remember how to do this. This is derivatives we do when we want to find the gradient at the specific point on a curve. To do this, you take the index, you multiply it with a coefficient in front of the x. There's nothing, imagine there's a 1. 4 times 1 is, well, it's right here, 4. Then you subtract 1 from the index. 4 minus 1 is x cubed. Then we do 2 times minus 8 is minus 16. Subtract 1 from that 2. That will be 1 or just nothing. Okay. The last one, I mean, imagine there's x to the power of 0. 5 times 0 is 0. Nothing. When there's a term without any unknowns, it just falls away. And there we go, 4x cubed minus 16x. Okay, correct answer only, nothing else. One mark each for each term. Okay, so we got x cubed minus 8x squared plus 5. There's apparently three turning points to find the coordinates of these turning points. So when, where it turns this graph, the gradient there would be 0. In fact, let me show you, this is what the graph would look like, and there's the three turning points. Minus 2, minus 11, 0, 5, and 2, minus 11. This is what we're looking for now, without using a graph. Of course, you don't have the graph, but this is what we're going. Turning point, of course, if you draw a tangent there, it would be a horizontal line. The gradient at those points is 0. Okay. So all we need to do is we need to take our equation for x cubed minus 16x and set it equal to 0 and then solve it okay let's have a look how can we do that first i'll look for common factors right uh, 4x cubed means 4 times x times x times x 16 we can write that as 4 times 4 and then there's 1x okay meaning common factor there is a 4 
and an X. That's what we do there. We write that in front, the 4 and the X. And inside, we got left an X squared and the 4. Nice. Okay. Now, recognize that that's a complete square inside the bracket. So we can break that down to X minus 2, X plus 2. Factorizing complete squares. Please have a look at that. Great. We now got three parts there. We can set each one of those equal to 0. We can say 4X equals 0 x minus 2 equals 0, x plus 2 equals 0. Divide here both sides by 4, which means we're doing 0 divided by 4, which is just 0. Good, we got the x coordinate of one of our answers. Move that 2 across, the minus becomes a positive, we got another x value, and move that plus 2, it becomes negative 2, we got another x value. Now to find the y Values. Where is there a y here? Anywhere, anywhere. Do we see a y? Oh, yes, there is the y. So, meaning if we want to find the y, we need to substitute our values into the original equation. So the first one I'm going to do is substitute it for 0. So, 0 to the power of 4 minus 8 times 0 squared plus 5. Now, of course, 0 to the power of 4 is 0, 0 squared is 0, 0 times minus 8 is 0, we're left with 5. Nice. Next, we uh, substitute the 2 in there. Okay, and let's not waste our time, just grab your calculator, don't break your head over it, it's 2 to the power of 4 minus 8 times 2 squared plus 5 minus 11. Last one, we substitute the minus 2 in there. And we did it in the calculator. Very important here is remember to use brackets. So if you've got a bracket, good, just put the minus. If you don't have a bracket, put the bracket negative bracket and we get minus 11 again just as i've shown you before where was it there we go zero five minus two minus eleven two minus eleven okay one mark for writing your equation equal to zero that's quite easy and then there are factorizing factorizing finding the x values finding the y values Again, yeah, study this, a lot of students didn't try, and um, show the method, okay, you lose method marks if you don't show it. Which one of these is the maximum? All right, now I've shown you the graph already, which one is the maximum? You can see it, 0, 5. So how would you write that? All right, let's think. 0, 5 is the maximum. Because uh, what do you say? The y value equals 5. y equals 5. Whereas in 2 minus 11 and 211, no, minus 211, y equals minus 11. You think that's a good answer? I don't know. 0, 5 with correct reasoning. I did this one. Evaluate correctly both values of y on either side. Reasonable correct sketch you can also do. You can just write 0 0.5 and draw them a sketch. Okay. Okay, there are methods, second derivatives, etc. I think mine's the quickest. I think I should get hobo full marks. Could spend all day talking about this, but I want to get on. Oh, we're finished. Yeah, I'd rather go have a siesta than talk about second derivatives. So, sorry, that was all for today. I know you've been having lots of fun, but it's siesta time. See you again soon.